Hey everyone, I'm Dave Butler. I'm Grace Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. Y'all, we are wrapping up the New Testament. If it's your very first time, this is our scripture study class. Welcome. We've been through the whole New Testament. We started with Matthew 1 right at the very, very beginning Christmas, and now we're to Christmas again. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> um, so we're just getting bit close to the end. Listen, I can't remember if we said this last week or if I was just thinking it, but Sometimes the second half of the New Testament is kind of hard because the first half is the Gospels and it's just a win no matter what. And the second half is harder to do classes with. Um, it's harder um, to study. Yeah, to even. study. Some of the language is kind of difficult, although hopefully you're finding some really cool things along the way as you're reading. It's just, it's got great one-liners, great kind of proverb type things. It's like beautiful instruction in the way to live. Remember these these were the leadership of the church who were trying to like train up kids in the kids, people, in the, but they call them kids, <laughs> yeah. right? Like several times throughout this, you'll, you'll hear John, John, John and Jude say, <laughs> call the people children because they, they feel a responsibility to teach them in the ways of Jesus. I mean, like, let me train you up in the way that you should go in the way that you should live. Um, yesterday, one of my kids, they were playing outside um, and um, I don't know why this is a thing that they did, but as their friend was running away, they threw a rock at their friend as he was running away, Perfect. just a little rock, but hit the neighbor instead. <laughs> and then they went running into the house because they were just kind of embarrassed and everything. And and just, you know, it was awkward. And my son was so scared to go over and say he was sorry, but I felt a responsibility as a dad to teach him, we're the kind of people who say sorry when we hurt people. Or if we make a mistake, that's what we do. And I felt that obligation as somebody who knows that, who knows that living a life of saying sorry is an abundant way to live. And I want to teach my kids that. And so I think that these, the writers of the New Testament, I love when they call them children because I think they feel that same sense of a responsibility to train them up in the ways of, of Jesus. Let's, let me show you what it was like, especially those who knew him, to live, we saw the way that he lived. We saw how it was the better way. We saw what happened to people's hearts. We saw what happened to families and relationships. We saw what happened to people's dreams. We saw their hopes come alive when they lived after the manner of Jesus. We are his apprentices, and now we're trying to pass that on, you know, to you. Well, and it's so cool. I've never thought of this before, how the New Testament is set up, that it really did get set up Savior first and behavior second. Mm. That it's just like, okay, wait, actually, you need to know him and meet him and understand who he is. And then let's unpack behavior that follows after that. Right. I think that's a good pattern for life. Mm -hmm. that it's, I think sometimes we accidentally fall under the tendency of teaching behavior first. Yeah. I think it's easier to teach that way. But I think there's something special about the New Testament that shows Savior first and behavior second. Yeah. You know? That it's, it becomes a reflection. Yeah, your um, behavior is actually your response to what you just learned about Jesus. Yeah. And you saw that the way that he lived, it's, yeah. a, it's a reflection of the love that he gave you. And we'll see that later in these chapters. But also it's an Im invitation because you saw like the way that you live, the fir first John could almost be divided into two big themes where he says, you walk in light and you walk in love. And when you walk in light and you walk in love, it means you walk with God. Like those are the two things. And and it was an invitation because people could look at Jesus and they could see the way that he lived his life and the way they interacted with people and the way that he was so settled and he was at home despite all the persecution, despite anything that was going wrong. They may have looked at him and thought, how are you like that? And how do you solve situations in such a um, majestic way? And so it, it was kind of both of those things. Yeah. It led people to, I think, want like, I want to live this kind of behavior. Yeah, it and was less about rules of... and more about like, oh wait, I just like saw someone and knew someone and experienced someone and now my behavior has changed because of him. Right. I was thinking the other day about that idea of rules. That that word is used in two different ways. Sometimes people use it as rules, like a list of rules. But then sometimes someone says like, it was the rule of life. It was my rule. of. It was like the rule of thumb. It was the... Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like a little more abstract. Like it's bigger. General. Like yeah. here's the rule of life. Yeah. The way that he lived. And I think today that you'll see from mm, cool. John and Jude who knew Jesus personally, they are 
almost teaching what they've already taught. So most Bible scholars think, and you'll see this on the Tippins. Remember, we have the Tippins for both of these books, John, 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 and Jude, that John is most likely that beloved disciple, the, the writer of the Gospel of John, and also the book of Revelation, which we're getting to next time. Remember, we end really, really exciting. Everybody, <laughs> <laughs> we're ending really, really exciting. So this is the last letters. These are the last letters that we're doing today. And then Revelation was a letter, but it was a wow kind of letter, <laughs> just so y'all know. But John, this beloved disciple who knew Jesus, and then Jude, who's actually one of his brothers. And so if you look in the beginning of that book of John, the way it starts, in fact, is he says this, 1 John chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, <laughs> which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Remember John 1 that John writes, the gospel of John chapter one starts, he was the word and the word was with God and the word came to the world. And now he's saying that word of God is, he came to the earth and we heard him and we saw him and, I, and we touched him. It's cute because this is like a sequel. To, right. You're, like, it's like you get like the, Here's the beginning. 10 years later, not yes, really, yeah. but you know. Yeah. And he said, and we were, verse three, we, those things that we saw and heard, we declare unto you that you may also have fellowship with us. We lived in fellowship with Jesus of Nazareth. And now we're inviting you into that fellowship. You can live as if you were with us in those days in Capernaum. And you were with us in those days in Jerusalem. You can, you can be a part of this. I wrote somewhere with that phrase fellowship meant in Greek. Oh, right here. It comes from a word that means a participation in God's own love and life. You can participate in his life and you can participate in his love the same way that we did. It's a, he's, he's bringing us in to that. We saw him, we heard him, we knew him. And now we're bringing you in so that you can experience the same kind of thrill and the same kind of acceptance that we did. Remember, John never calls himself by name in the gospel of John. He only calls himself the one Jesus loved. That's how he wants to be known. His interactions with Jesus led him to give himself that name. It's like, I was, I'm the one Jesus loved. And he experienced that. And he's saying, you can experience that too. Which is so cool because sometimes I feel like when I read the first half of the Old Testament, it almost makes me jealous. Oh, the you New know. Testament? Yeah, the New oh, Testament. Yeah. That I'm just like, Wait, I wish that I got to live that. I wish mm -hmm. that was my day. And I love that he's like, wait, actually it can be. Like you want to experience it. Let me invite you into the story. Come and participate. You, you can not only, you don't, you're not just an observer or a reader anymore. Participate in the life and love of Jesus. That's mm -hmm. what John, John, John <laughs> is doing. Same John, everybody. So three, three different <laughs> three guys. Three different times. So let's jump in into this first um, uh, just John, what John says. If you go to John chapter two, uh, scroll down until you get to about verse 12 and you hear some of the people that he's talking to. And this is kind of cool because he, he talks to what seems like a bunch of different people. I write unto you little children. And then he says, I write unto you fathers. I write unto you young men. And it's cool because John seems to be writing to everybody who is maybe on a spectrum of participation in the love and life of Jesus. That remember John chapter one, the gospel of John, I'm, I'm, am I confusing everybody? By, <laughs> it's, I saying, it's not my fault. There's a lot I'm of not John's the one who like named it all the same book. There's a lot of okay? John's going on. But in the gospel of John chapter one, it started with John the Baptist who knew Jesus, loved Jesus, was changed by Jesus and people could tell. And so some of the people who would hear him preach and come and were, and were his disciples, he would always say, I can't wait for you to meet Jesus. Your life will be so different. Then one day Jesus comes, you remember, and John says, behold, the Lamb of God, there he is. And two of them start to follow him down the road. And he turns and he asks, what is it that you want? Which is such a great question. They treat it literal, and maybe it was, but I love 
hearing Jesus ask me at the beginning of any spiritual journey, David, what do you want? What are you looking for? What are you hoping for? What is slacking in you? Like, or not slacking, but like, um, slack your thirst means to get rid of what is slack your thirst to like get it. Anyways, <laughs> I, that might be the right word, everybody. I don't, it just, came, it just came out, but you, it's that, what is it you're lacking? What is it you're hoping for? What is it that you're wishing? And they, he in, says to these two boys, come and see. When they say, we want to know what you're all about. We want to know why does, why is John so into you? And his invitation in the very, very beginning was come and see. And that would be someone who I would say is a spiritual child. You're just, you're just learning. All of us are going to be somewhere on this spectrum of the, the level of participation in the love and life of Jesus, the intensity of our relationship with him, right? The maturity of our relationship with him. So it's neat that John is talking to everybody. We're, we're all in different places with this, but we all can participate and we, can all, we all can progress also. And that everyone gets that same invitation. Right. It's like, oh no, actually you can come and see. Mm-hmm. You get to come and experience this. Right. Wherever and, you're at. And it would begin there. Now, I don't know if John meant to do this, but we put together, we kind of mapped it out what, what he was saying in First John chapter 2. And it was neat to see that these were, these would be, I think, experiences that a lot of us, if we gathered together and talked about our own progression in relationship with Jesus, that we would come away and say, these are some of the things I experienced. I, I don't think it's linear ever. I don't no. want to make this linear. Um, I think relationship with Jesus is too rich to put it on a line and to give it steps. But I think some of this, you you would say, oh, that did come before this in my experience. Although all of them, I think you would be re- repeating over and over again. That's making more sense if you're reading the board right now, but we'll start reading some of them to you if you're a listener. Um and, and you'll get what we're saying. But to the children, he writes in verse 12, your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. When I read that, I, I thought of Joseph Smith going into the grove, seeking salvation. Remember, he was like, I was concerned about the salvation of my soul. And in one of the accounts of the first vision, the very first thing that he is told is your sins are forgiven you. That's the, that was the initial, that's what he was looking for. I'm concerned about the, the salvation of my soul. I'm troubled by my sins. And in that relationship with Jesus, in what some of his first days, his first encounters was a forgiveness of sins. I think that's something we experience all along the way, but... And it's so cute that that's almost how Jesus wants to introduce himself. Mm. That he's like, wait, like, actually, like, if this, the, I, I'm happy to say this at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Thrilled I want to you say to, it. Yeah. Worth, worth the price. Yeah. Worth the cost. I want you to know that from the very beginning. Yeah. Second, he says to the young men, and he repeats in 13 and 14, but in 12, I mean, in 13, he says to the young men, because you've overcome the wicked one, which seems to be a next, like, I don't want to use the word step because I just said I don't want to make him steps, but I'm going to use it, that my sins are forgiven, great, but my heart hasn't changed. There's something about clearing the record, which is fantastic. But I still have a heart that's prone to sin and prone to wander. Yeah. Help me overcome that in my life. And I love in, is it in 14? Yeah. Where he says, where is it, Grace? Um, because you are, you are strong and the word of God abideth in you. At the end of 14. Yeah. And I, I, that's really cool. that he's like, you're going to overcome the world because the word of God abides in you. And it makes me want to think. When you hear word of God, initially you think, oh, scripture. But I want to say, what scripture is abiding in you? What oh, words powerful. What words is he saying to you that's making you strong? Right? And, yeah, keep going. Well, no, no, go. Well, I'm and just, like, really what a powerful saying. thought, because I feel like sometimes that really feels like a battle, overcoming the wicked one. Mm-hmm. And I love the thought, if you are in the middle of that battle, what if you started studying for the words you need in you right now? Mm-hmm. That it's like, okay, actually... I need that like imprinted in my head. Like I want that imprinted on my heart because I know when the battle comes, if there's words I can go to, I can be stronger now. Yeah. And Jesus said that when, when he encountered the devil out in the wilderness. Yes. 
right? That he's there and Jesus combats him with, where he says to him, I live by the words of God. And it's interesting that the most recent words of God that Jesus heard were in the baptism, right? When he was there, God spoke to him and said, you are mine. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Those words that God put into him, I think gave him power over the devil. God actually spoke words to him. He's not talking about memory, you know. Yeah. Like, well, the scriptures are God's words. But that's the cutest part is that I love that, like, oh, actually, that's how he's going to speak to you. Right. Like, you can have just, I, that's one of the reasons I love the scripture so much is because I'm like, oh, no, actually, like, when I read these, it's not just like a verse that I'm memorizing that's a verse in a textbook. It's actually the ones that I love the most are the ones that I, like, hear God speaking to me. Mm-hmm. You know, but mm-hmm. it's like, oh no, like actually that's not that one. Like I'm like, I like want to be like, I'm confident that that one was written for me. Mm. That's mine. He like wrote that with me in mind. So, you awesome. know, yeah. I'm like, that's cool. But like, find that. Mm. Yeah. Cause that's what he carried on. Is that his personal ones? Yeah. So then fathers or the message translation says veterans, which I think is cool. You have known him from the beginning. There's something about that. That's like, I don't know about him. I know him. We know each other. I know what he would do in a moment like this. I I really love when Peter stands on the steps of the temple in Acts chapter three mm. and acts just like Jesus. Because he says, I know him. I knew I know what he would do in a situation like this. It seems a little bit more progressive. You know, it like he's progressed along is what yeah. I mean by that. Yeah. Well, and what I love so much about it is it's so cute when it's veterans. Because I'm like, oh, actually, that's someone who lived through something. Oh, that is cool. Especially you know? after you said this is a battle verse. Yeah. It's like, oh, wait, actually, I lived through that. That's how I got to know him is I actually lived it. Mm-hmm. You there, know? Jesus comes away from the 40 days in the wilderness different than when he went in. Because he overcame the adversary yes. in battle. And he will come with those experiences out. And I think that's true for all of us. That we come away from the things that we've overcome different. Well, and yeah, go. No, I was gonna say, and because we overcame them with him, we became acquainted with him. I became acquainted with you in my battles. You stood next to me when I wanted to give up hope, and I didn't. You stood next to me when I wanted to give into temptation, and you gave me strength not to. You spoke your word into me, and and those become experiences where we become acquainted with him, and we say, after I've known, I knew him, I known him, I've known him. He's been there. We've we did the battle together. Well, and it makes me just, there's something about that idea of actually living it that I think so often, I'm just thinking of so many people who have asked me like, oh, how do I get to know Jesus? Like, how do I actually get to experience him? How do I get to know him? And even like in my head, how many times I've gone into conversations and I like, and think like in my head, I want that person to already know him. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want to talk like that. And it's so cool for me to step back and be like, oh, actually, I think sometimes we think like get to know him and we want to memorize facts on a paper. And I love that like when you read verse 14, it's like, wait, 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 actually, you want to get to know him, live life with him, right? experience this, yeah, go through it, have your sins be forgiven. You want to know Jesus, let him, like experience forgiveness with him. Mm-hmm. You want to get to know Jesus, oh, actually overcome something in battle with him. Bring him into the story. Ask yeah. for his help. Ask for his advice. Yes. Ask him what he thinks of you. Have it, what's your, you know, all of those things are ways that we, I love what you're saying. And it's just so cool to think like, oh, actually, if you want to help someone get to know Jesus, start living it with them, you know? Like help them experience him. Like it's not just gonna be sit down and write facts about him out, but it's gonna be like, oh, actually help people experience him. Get them in a place that it's like their life with him, you know? Yeah. So, I don't, that was like a messy way of describing that, but that's just a cool thought in my head. Well, and I think it's a, a the, the whole thing is, because I was just thinking that cyclical, then somewhere, you're, I'm a veteran, but I still need my sins forgiven. I still have oh, things yeah. that I have to overcome. And that's why, and it is a messy experience and, and it's not linear. And I think there's something cool about that. Look at some of these other verses, 217. I think he's actually talking about the world passing away, like this old world and a new world is coming. But I love thinking about the fact that I need that old world to pass away in me and my lusts also. I need them to I need those to die out of me. It's the whole imagery of baptism is let 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 my sins and my lusts and the world die in me and let me rise. Let me be born again in you. And 
And the, and the words there, 17 keeps going, he says, and do the will of God and abide forever. Do, like, there's something about a relationship when somebody teaches, when you do the will of God, you're, it means you're trusting him, you're looking to him, um, you honor him, you believe him. That does something to a relationship. You abide in him when you do his his will. He's going to tell you what his will is simply stated in just a second. I'll give it away. It's, <laughs> you know, love. Love is what he says. It's like it was simply stated, but that word abide in him, the message translates abide as live deeply in him. Um, unpack your bags. Uh, in Spanish, the word abide is permanecer. How about that? Yeah. A little accent. Did you like where that went? Um, which you can, you can see has the word permanence in here. Move in. Change, it's not temporary. Yeah, change your address. Be here. Mm. Abide in him. I'm here for the long haul. I'm here for the difficult, the ones I don't want to do. I'm here for the battle. I'm here for all the parts of this. I wanna I wanna live life under your direction and under your your teaching. And that's gonna have its difficulties when I do that. And and let that world burn out of me, Lord. Um, and then this verse 25. Mm. which, oh, let me throw in 20 because it's got that cool word, but you have an unction <laughs> from the Holy One. That unction is, is Greek for an anointing. You have to know this is not a journey that we do through our own will and grit. We're actually anointed. We are blessed with an added measure of grace, an added measure of his presence, an added measure of his strength to be able to live this out. And I think there's, um, I think there's wisdom in God giving us, at least in my experiences, just enough strength that it requires me to stretch, but within reach. Mm. There's, I think there's wisdom in the the amount of additional grace and strength He He gives. Yeah, right? there's still but, growth. But twenty five says, and this is the promise that He hath promised us, even eternal life. And you will see several times in these letters. I know I've said this before, and hopefully you've heard it, I'll say it again, that Jesus speaks of eternal life in a present tense. He doesn't talk about it as a future goal, but he's, you can experience a degree of eternal life today and a greater degree of eternal life tomorrow. For this is eternal life, that, that they may know thee, the only true Father and your Son who, whom you have sent. That, that you can experience, when you are living in and under the direction grace, power, presence of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, when you're abiding in them, you are experiencing eternal life. You're experiencing the fruits of eternal life. You're living in a loving union with the Godhead and, and the people around you, and that you're living it. You're living a degree of it. There's more to come, but you can experience it today. Which is so cute that he reminds you of that after he already explained knowing him. You know, mm -hmm. that he's like, oh, actually eternal life really is knowing him. Yeah. And don't you forget that we already talked about that. Yeah. You want to know eternal life? This. Right? Yeah. Right. It's forgiveness of sins, overcoming the world. Watch how that. it goes into someone who divided the chapter into chapter three. I think it just, you know, flows into and starts in one. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Like, why is someone like, how can someone like me be un treated as a son under his care and taught as a son and corrected as a son? And, and why am I allowed to grow up with him as my father? He's not like the president of the United States, like unreachable, but I get to grow up with him in the same household. And like, and in and, and that kind of close relationship. And he says this, beloved, verse two, now we are the sons of God. And it does not appear yet what we shall be. There's you've come so far as his sons, but man, there's so much greater coming. You don't even know yet what you could be, what you can become. And then he says, But we know that when he shall appear, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And there's something, two parts about that, that one, he will be so familiar to us because we have done life together but also will become like him, which is another element in that. There's one thing for him to forgive me and to teach me, but for, but for me to start to become even like him. 
that I, that I would begin to be merciful like he is, patient like he is, hopeful like he is, say the words that he would say, treat people like he would. Like that change can actually occur in me and my heart and soul and future and views and all those things can change to become like him. So it's really, really cool. And, and wherever you are on this, if you're at come and see or if it, wherever you're at. And um, I think that's uh, because it's cyclical. We all can be learning from each other through this process and, and be inspired by each other also when we're, when we're in it. Beautiful. Um, one, there's just something so powerful to me about the fact that John doesn't want you to forget about love. Like that is the biggest reminder to me in all of his letters that he's like, wait, 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 like actually this is something that cannot be forgotten. He wants to repeat it 1800 times, which in my head, I'm just like, oh, actually you really care that when we like walk away from this, that's what we remember. And it makes sense because were you going here? No, 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 go, go, go. Uh, no, I just to? like that you're so excited. <laughs> That's what I was like, getting, no, it made me get I excited. Like, I was like, okay. The same thing? Um, that at the, when the gospel of John, which the same John writes, he writes about the final conversation that they have at the Last Supper in more detail than Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. We know that there's the Last Supper. We know that there's the sacrament that's instituted. We know there's you know, a hymn, but we have chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 in the gospel of John that are a record of the conversation that they have all together and go through those chapters and mark how many times it says love. And I think you wrote this in that thing I was editing of yours, <laughs> the, um, that it was his dying wish. Mm. This is my, his dying wish was please love each other. If, if I, I have a final word to say to, to y'all before I go, and it's take care of each other, love each other, abide in love. Love is the great and grand commandment. And, and you see that in John 14 so much. And he almost seems to be repeating it in this verse. Which makes it right even here. more tender for real, because then all of a sudden in your head, that dying wish must have meant so much to John. That he said, oh, if you weren't there to hear it yourself, let me make sure that that's not forgotten. And maybe it's his dying wish now too. Yeah. And he's like, Jesus taught us how to abide and have fellowship and participate in his life. I'm now going to show you how to do it also. And, and I don't know how many years later this is, but it seems to me as later, John now calling people children, he seems to be mature. He seems to be a leader in the church to say, I've lived the law of love. Now I'm, I'm uh, commissioning you to live that also. Mm -hmm. See where it takes you. It's just like, oh, here's like, this is an important one. Yeah. You know? That a life led by God is going to be a life of love. Yes. How do I know that this is uh, God and not me? Is there love in it? Am I so? Then, yeah, then it's from God. Am I moving in the right direction? Is there love? Am I growing? Is, is there love? Is love a, is a, is abundant, a God-led life? will be a life that is littered with love. Well, and it's so powerful to me because I think a lot of the times when we speak about love, we speak about it almost abstractly. And no one really like deeply unpacks it. They just assume that you know what's happening. And I think that's one of the coolest things about John is that he actually wants to unpack the word love. Mm -hmm. That he's like, oh, I don't want you to be confused. I want this one to be clear. And it seems to me that like nearly all of chapter four and a lot of chapter three is him being like, okay, listen, I'm going to talk about love and I need to make sure that you know what love is, what it looks like, how it's lived. Yeah. And what happens is all of a sudden you get into this and there's so many verses that this is what me and David were saying is that it really makes you just want to write love is at the top of a paper and start listing attributes of where he teaches you what love actually looks like. Mm -hmm. What is love? And you're going to go through and it starts in verse th in chapter three um, if you and go, if, you're, if you're listening to the podcast, we have all these hearts with the verses on it. So if you're teaching a class or something be so like cute. that, it would just, this could be a really cool thing to do. Valentine's Day yeah, we're having the Valentine's, end of the year. Yeah, yeah. It's Thanksgiving, fine. Christmas, and Valentine's Day. Surprise. All together. Um, and if you go through, and I don't even want to spoil it because you might just want to do it for yourself, but you just love that it's going to start saying, even in verse 16, love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That all of a sudden, that's going to teach you what love actually looks like. Mm. And then if you go down to verse 18, 
Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Love isn't something you just say. You don't just tell people that you love them. You actually do it. You love. Love is an action. Love is a verb. And then all of a sudden there's something so powerful to me that it's matched up with truth. That you, like, that is, you have to love in, there is going to be something about speaking truth that is involved in love. Mm -hmm. And if you, you can just go through, verse 23 is so cute too, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commitment. This is going to be something important. That is, this is his commandment, is actually loving each other. Yeah. That is what he's asking you to do. In chapter four, verse seven, love one another for love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And verse six right above that, I love that it says we are of God because it matches so clearly to me in verse eight. He that loveth not knoweth not, whoa, whoa, whoa. He that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love. That all of a sudden it's saying, listen, we actually are of God. We're made in his, his image. We are his. That is true. And you need to remember that God is love. And it, oh, and then you have to read this verse with it. And it's interesting that you just said that because it's, um, if we're made in his image, then that means we are made to love. And if we're not loving people, we're not fill, fulfilling the measure of our creation. And I think we'll feel that on a soul level. Mm. He says, love looks like in one of those laying down your life for other people. But I'm tempted to live selfishly as if that's the right way to live. As if that will, will give me the abundant life. And Jesus says, you're made of God. Which means selfishness will leave you feeling hollow. And laying down your life for someone else a day at a time is going to enrich it. And our brains don't believe that. As much as we know to answer on a test, money doesn't <laughs> buy happiness. It's like my brain actually thinks, but I think it does. <laughs> I'm like, I bought, a, I bought a few things I really like. <laughs> you know? And Jesus says, he's just teaching that. There's something about that that's really cool, being made in his image, which means we're made to love. Which And it goes so well to me with verse number 12 in chapter 4 too. No man has seen God at any time. That's true. We, like, we just don't, we don't see him every day. But then the second half, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. Yeah, we actually haven't seen him. We don't get to see him face to face, to face. but we get to see glimpses of him in everyone we meet. And I love thinking, oh yeah, actually love gets to dwell in us. That means that God dwells in us. And that means that when we meet people, we actually get to meet him. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that all the best parts of him are in us. And so when we're loving other people, when we're hearing their stories, when we're meeting them, we actually get to meet God. And that is love. Yeah. I'm so intrigued with the end of 12 and his love is perfected in us. That it will grow and it will change in us. It will, like that's, you You can love today in a diff, you'll love in 10 years differently than you love today. Like the, the way you love can be perfected. Uh, we wanted to read this quote from um, Mother Teresa as part of just the idea of like seeing, there's this fantastic book and I wish I could remember the name. You're just going to Google it and you, you, you'll find it. But she wrote these letters to her bishop all throughout her ministry. And you find out and you discover that she really struggled with her faith and she really struggled feeling the presence of God. She really struggled seeing him in her story. And then she makes this conclusion at one point that she was like, and then I realized I saw his face every day when, when, when I looked down on the, on the, th th those on the, I saw the face of Jesus on the side of the road. She says something along those lines. And this is one of the, um, her writing. She says, I see Jesus in every human being. I say to myself, this is hungry Jesus. I must feed him. This is sick Jesus. This one has leprosy or gangrene. I must wash him and tend to him. I serve because I love Jesus. And there's something really powerful about that. Our, 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 our spirits know it. I'm thinking about that line from Les Mis, to love another person is to see the face of God. Like poets mm -hmm. know it. Writers know it. Historians know it. But there's a power to that, to love that's not of this world, that we can't, we couldn't have created it. It's too big. 
it's it's too you know majestic. I've said that twice in this lesson. I don't know. I just in <laughs> that word, everybody. But it's too, our souls know that love is not of of this world, but it was a gift to this world. Which is so powerful when you go to verse nineteen in chapter four. We love him because he first loved us. And that automatically is a connection back to the very beginning that actually love means laying down your life. Love got to be personified in Jesus. And now love gets to be personified in all of us. Mm -hmm. And there's something so beautiful. of Oh, actually, you can see love in a cross and you get to see love in a tomb. And now we get to see love in each other because of him. Yeah. That love actually was personified. It, get, it got to be him. And now because of that, we get to know who God is better because of him and because of each other. Mm. That gets to come to life. Yeah. And I think that's one of my favorite parts about the worksheet. But wait, wait. Oh. First tell the, the story of, the, of, Mexico. of Mexico. Because I just as you are saying what you were just saying, I was like, wait, wait, tell, just talk about, talk about Mexico for a second. Okay, so there's this tiny church in the middle of a dump in Tijuana. And um, it's that I think is a sermon in and of itself. That it's just like, yeah, there's there is some Jesus in the middle of one of the places me and David have both gone. One of the places that is like the most poor and run down mm -hmm. and weary. There's a little church in the middle, and on the outside, when you right when you enter the church or leave it, um, there's a cross on the outside, and the only made scripture, of made of two by fours. Yeah, made of two by fours, <laughs> and you can see the nails, and they are crooked. They weren't even like it was just like. Hammered up. Yeah, yeah, the cutest little cross ever. And it looks well-worn, which is cool. And the only verse on that cross is, we love him because he first loved us. And maybe that is a testimony of, you know what? The world is going to wear you down. That is true. And in a, in a worn down world, sometimes love is hard to find. And I love that on your way out, the first thing you can see is the cross that it can be evidence that actually love can be found on the darkest days, on the hardest days, on the worn down days. That actually can be proof of love. The cross can be. And we actually can love. We're capable of love. We can love confidently and unafraid and unashamed because we can know that actually first we were loved. Sometimes I think we hesitate to love because we're scared someone doesn't love us back. And I love that Jesus was never afraid to be the one that loved more. And the impact that that great act of love has had is evidence of the power of love. 2,000 years ago, he hung on a cross and, and demonstrated his love and the love of the Father. And it's inspiring people still today. It's changing people's lives still today that love the love of God has that kind of power because that that little church is built up. Its ministry is to feed the feed the hungry that live inside that dump. And I am just fascinated by the fact that whoever built that church and started that ministry said, the reason we do this is because he loved us first. I think about Matthew 25, where Jesus talks about the idea of when, when did we see you? And then he just says, when I was hungry, you gave me meat. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came unto me. And, they, and, and they'll say, Lord, we never saw you. And he says, well, when you did it unto other people, I took that personally, that you did it unto me. But it makes me want to step back one step and say, I can say to the Lord, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came unto me and you set me free. And that is why I feel conditioned and commissioned to do that for other people. Because you first did it to me. You fed me. And I, and, and, and I cannot now help but not feed someone else. You set me free. How can I, you know, that, there's, that act of love inspires, love reciprocates love. That's and it's it cool that love is how God shows up, you know? Mm. That I love to think about the world right now. And sometimes I wonder where God is. And in my head, oh, if God is love, that means that anywhere that love shows up, God's showing up for Amen. me. You Amen. know? And 
That is the cute. So the worksheet this week, you guys, it's my favorite worksheet ever. I am obsessed with it. And it lays out and it just has that verse. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And um, it has like three different sections, the date, the location, and what love looked like. And I love to think that if you want to figure out where God is showing up in your story, look for love and call it out for what it is. Don't miss it. You know, yeah. it's just like, oh, actually put a date on that and put a location and actually say what love looked like, because that is what God looks like. Yeah. You are seeing him. Mm-hmm. It's just true. The yeah. scripture, even John wants to say that that's true. God is love and love is God. Yeah. Right. And it, I think it would be so cool. There's so many different things that you could do with this. You could leave it on your fridge all week and you could write where he has showed up mm-hmm. this week that it's like, okay, actually on Monday this week at 2.04, he showed up in da 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 whatever it is, in a text from a friend or someone dropping off a treat or whatever it's going to be. Listing that out by the week could be so powerful. But I also just thought how cool it would be if you had a class to pass this out to everyone and say, okay, I want you to go to your camera roll. And I want you to just like go, like start January 1st. It's almost the end of the year. Start January 1st. And I want you to look. Your camera roll does it for you. That's the lucky thing. It will say the date, it will say the time, and it will actually show you cool. a picture of what it looked like. Cool. How cool would it be to just go through and be like, you know what? This year, this is what love looked like. This year, this is what God looked like. Yeah. And here's my pictures of when I saw it. Yeah. Which, right. it could, be, which could be so fun. There's so yeah. many things you could do with this. It's so cute. Yeah. And I just, I think it's, it inspires you to then think how easily I can bring God into a story, a situation, a relationship, a tragedy, a disaster, a sorrow by simply loving in any degree, and I bring God into, into that place. Mm. But this is really cool. This is what love looked like. Oh, this will be really, really awesome. And if I'm a teacher, I'm actually going to hand this out, and then I'm going to send a reminder every single day. Cool. And then, then the end of the week, because we don't see each other every two weeks or something like that, like take a picture and let's put it in a group chat or so many ways that we can, you know. And in my head, this is what I just want to think. If you have them go through your camera roll, don't you want to show have everyone choose their picture from the yeah. year and then do show and tell with where, what, well, guys, whoever's what teaching did God this look week, like? You're so lucky. You're lucky. This is the best God. week ever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's fine. Everyone. Um, this, this next little spot in John chapter five, I think is really neat because if I've been a person who's been so loved by God that I've, I've witnessed it, I've experienced it. I, when I see it again and again and again, it multiplies that's in a spot somewhere in this chapter. Like, I wish I could remember where it was. Is that the beginning? Was, oh, it may have been of John 1. Yeah, I think so. No. Oh, uh, it might be Jude. Yeah, it's fine. It's but, Jude. But I do love um, that if I'm a recipient of that kind of love, I that changes my relationship with God. Mm. If I first and foremost know the love of Jesus and the Father on the cross, the ultimate act of love, and I've experienced that love, then if I begin to experience his love in other ways throughout my life, our relationship is enriched. It's different. As I love other people, that relationship is enriched and different. And I am more and more convinced that God's as wildly loving as 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 He's been purported to be in reported to be in Scripture. And if you go to that John 15, 14, it talks about prayer and he says, This is the confidence that we have in Him. It changes every aspect of your relationship. President Nelson in the last general conference gave this name to prayer, which is living discussions. That is a, both of those words, but those words together is so intriguing to me that a prayer would be a living discussion. It sounds like someone I know really well. It sounds like someone that I would have a push and pull. It sounds like someone that I would ask follow-up questions. But in those living discussions, verse 14 and 15 says, we can enter in in confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. I have witnessed his love over and over and over again, so I know he's listening. And I know his will is good. And I know if he hears whatever I ask, that the promise is in place. And if I don't see it, there's love behind the motivation and there's love behind the waiting or there's love behind the no. I just, when I'm fully convinced that God is a God of love, 
I enter into, into our living discussions together with a greater measure of confidence. And, um, and I don't hold back. And I can ask for help. And I can, my Thanksgiving is richer as we talk. Every, every part of it is, um, comes more alive. It comes alive. Well, and this is so funny because I didn't even remember this until you were just talking. But I remember the first time I ever read these verses, I was on my mission. And it was probably like one week into my mission. And I remember thinking, there's no way. Like, I just like, I didn't know God like that yet in the sense that I was just like, there's no way that that's actually true. And I remember thinking, I'm going to test it out. And so I would start praying for things and everything kept happening. And like, after like five days, I was like, this is kind of getting crazy. Like, I was like, there's no way. And I was like walking with my companion and I like remember praying. I was like, God, like, help me find a heads up penny. Like, I was just like, this is good. Like, it was like kind of a thrill. I was like, okay, like a lucky penny. Let me find a lucky penny. And we walked and walked and we had the longest walk ever. And then I completely forgot. And it was the next day driving in the car. And I remember thinking so clearly, I was like, oh, gotcha, God. Like, you were wrong because I didn't find a heads up penny yesterday. Mm. And I prayed for that. And I remember thinking, that's the first one. Like, you didn't get that one, God. And we like parked our car and got out. And as we were walking up to the door, this is for real, there was a trail of heads up pennies all the way to her front door and then like 18 on the ground. And I was being like, what is that breadcrumb story where they like leave them? I was picking up every single, my companion was like, what are you doing? I was like, you don't understand what just happened to me. I was like, this does not even make sense. And it like that, like a heads up penny became so clear proof to me of a God that hears. Mm. And now every time I see one, that's what I think is like, oh, I'm like, God hears me and God loves me and that is lucky. And like, I can't help but think like, I think this sometimes like God's like, no, actually try me on this one. Mm. You know, it's like, actually like, th- let's make this a living discussion. Right. Like, I think his will is actually good. You know, his will better when you know his character better. And we just learned that his character is love. Right. Right. And it's just like, oh yeah, like, let's try this one out. Mm-hmm. You know? And I, I think it's awesome. It's just a living discussion. He's not a vending machine. Those are not alive. And you don't have discussions with them. Yeah. Right. But, and, and you don't have discussions with, um, with uh, like business people and store people. Like there's, it, there's something about the fact that living discussions like teaches you what the kind of relationship is, what the kind of relationship can be. And, and that sometimes uh, it's a discussion isn't solved in one conversation. Sometimes. Right. Right. Yeah. You know? It's awesome. All right. Your favorite book of all of, well, I don't know, but Jude. You guys, and now I had to name my child Jude because I'm obsessed with this book so much. It's the cutest thing in the whole entire world. Yeah. And, um, okay, okay, I'm starting with this, but it's going to be confusing, but it's fine. I'm doing it anyways, because I just got a letter this week in the mail. I keep getting letters. Why do people Wait, I was keep... going to say, you said that last I week. I know, you guys, <laughs> this, I'm getting letters and it's my best day ever. Every single time I get one, I don't want to cry. I'm so excited. And I got this letter and, um... I like drove on a little bike ride and I was going to read it at like the top of this hill. I thought that was going to be cute. It was, you guys, it was cute. And Pause. I hold on. Everyone who's a teacher of a class, sometime by the end of the year, after studying all these letters, you have to now write a letter to the kids in your class and mail no, it to them. No, stop. So we're giving you that a couple weeks ahead of time so that you can Sorry. do it by the end of the year. Because yeah. after studying these letters, now don't, as the teacher, don't you want to write to your, yes, all the ones in your class and say, all right, we've read Paul's letters. We read James's. We read Peter's. Oh. We read Jude. We read John. Um, here's mine. Here's, here's what I believe. That could be awesome. Heads up. There's hurry, hurry, you all have to do that. It's going to be, <laughs> okay, sorry, it's gonna be a lot of work, but it's going to be worth it yeah. work. No, that was worth it. Story. That was fine. Sorry, because I just thought that. Idea. No, it's okay, because I got this letter, and it's fr- it was from someone that, like, I genuinely feel like knew me at my very best. Like, at, like, one of the mm. moments that I was, like, really, like, I, like, really felt like myself. Like, I was doing good. And it was so interesting reading the letter, because they, like, wrote who I was to them. And, like, it was probably the most beautiful thing I've ever read in my life. That's why I had to go to a hill because I was crying when I was reading it. And um, Do you go to the hills? You, <laughs> only, I only emotional? cry on hills. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened is I, like, walked away. And I was, like, biking home. And I wanted to be better. Like, really. Like, I, like, deeply. Like, I feel like it was, like, one. Like, it was, like, a big turning point for me. Like, this week it happened. But, like, probably in, like, the past year. That I like walked away from reading that letter with this desire to be so much better. And the desire didn't come because that person was like, here's all the things you're doing wrong. But it actually came from this moment that I was like, 
they see something in me that I don't see in myself and like all the time. And I want to live up to that. I want to be that person. And it's so interesting because that is to me a little bit how this letter from Jude fills because he's going to talk about two different types of people, but the way he talks about it to me, it is like looking at these people in love and saying, this is who you are. I know who you are and who you can be. And it changes the way the letter read to me because all of a sudden, rather than walking away discouraged with like this person that's like bad and messing up all the time, it actually is this moment that's like, wait, this is who you are. This is who you can be. And he like splits it up and we like put this on the board. And in verse 16, it starts and he starts talking about people and he's describing, he says, These are murmurers and complainers walking after their own lust and their mouth speaketh great swelling words like they're boastful and having men's person, like they're playing favorites. Um, And he calls them out. And I think sometimes we could get stuck on that part and be like, don't be this person, don't be this person, don't be this person. But he actually didn't stay there. What happens next is the most powerful part to me because he says, Because you, you don't have to be this. Yeah. You can get caught up in this. Right, yes. and abiding in like the the your your the addiction of lust and complaining and being you know separating from people and all these things, but you can be called to a better way. And I love that that's what he does. He it, yeah. like it almost is like he didn't even like even if you were that person for a second. I love that he says no, but beloved, remember, like that's not who you are. Who you are is this person. Um, And what happens is he starts describing these people and verse like 19, it's like all of these things, like there's so many good things because verse 19, he goes back and he's like, listen, they like, don't be the person that divides. That's not who you are. The sensual person having not the spirit. That is not who you are. Who you are, beloved, is the one that builds yourself up on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God living in love. That's who you are, beloved. That's who I know you as. Um, Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I know you are that person. And of some have compassion, make a, making a difference. You are a difference maker, beloved. I know that about you, that you actually make a difference. You others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. You are the type of person that actually looks at someone and pulls them out of a fire. You are a rescuer. That is who you are. Um, And there's something so important to me about realizing that. Is that like, wait a minute, actually, you're the type of person in the message. It says in verse 23, it says, um, you actually are tender with sinners. You care about them. And you're going to make sure That like by the end, you help them figure out how to build this life on repentance and on Jesus, but you're tender with them and you know how to help them. You know how to save them. And the reason why is because of verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. The one that picks you back up, that holds you steady. That's why I know that you're this person. I'm not going to help you change in fear calling you out and saying, you're doing all these things wrong. I'm actually going to remind you who you are. You are this person because you are standing next to someone that is keeping you up. The Mm -hmm. one that is going to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You are celebrating. That's what you get to be. That's why you can change Mm -hmm. is because I actually see you as this person. Walk away thrilled that that's who you are. That speaking Who someone is to someone is a lot more powerful in changing them, to me at least, than calling out the mistakes. Right. I think that's a cool lesson in Jude. Right. The very beginning of that letter, there's where that multiply verse is, where he says, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. You can live in the abundance of mercy, love, and peace. That's what you were made to. Beloved, he says in verse three, earnestly contend... Yes, beloved, if you see on the screen or if you see this later in the app, the, the two lists that we made, this says marked by his love. That's one way to define the word beloved, that you're somebody who's marked by his love. You're changed by his love. You abide in his love. You live in these things. A person, I just think you're kept or protected by love. 
you look for mercies. You make a difference in compassion. There's just, it's a different way to live. And in verse three, he says, I, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, he says, let's earnestly contend for the faith. Let's, let's convince people to live in this way. Mm. Earnestly, with zeal. Let's like fight for it. Let's fight for a better way of living. Let's raise people up in this privilege that they can have. And you can speak that to people. Yes, yes. Speak that. Tell them that you see them. You see this in them. Yeah. That's powerful. That brought me to tears. You and, know? It does, and it doesn't matter who they are because of verse 24. Yeah. You, you're not doing this on your own. No. You're enjoying this and experiencing it. You're co-creating this. You're abiding with someone who's able to keep you from falling. He's the one that actually makes you beloved. Right. You know? Yeah. And here at the very end, we wanted to do this and then go back to John, Second uh, John and Third John, because it seems to be like the best way to do that is in the way that you live. There's two bits of advice. One is in verse three of Second John, and it says this, grace be to you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. And he says, as we speak to people, as we, as we show a better way, we need to speak in truth and love to them. We can't speak only in love and we can't speak only in truth because that can be harsh. And only in love, you know, sometimes there are things that have to be cut out of us. And there's some things that have to, we have to be made aware of. We need the truth and we also need the love and we need them together. They need to be spoken together. And if you're going to lean to one side or the other, I'd pick love if I were you. And then, and, and he, he gives us that invitation in second John, which I love. But in third John, um, he's talking about this guy whose name is Gaius. He's written to this very, very, uh, of one specific person, Gaius. And he says this about him. I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that was in you, even as you walked in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatsoever you do to brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, or in the NIV, you made the faith visible. Mm. When people watched you and saw you, they realized what it looked like to abide in love and light. They looked, they, they saw what it looked like to live in relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the way that you live out your life. Yes, we should speak our words to people and contend with them and say, I, let me pull you to a better way in love and truth, both of them. But by the way I live, let that be a visible witness of what faith looks like, of what hope looks like, of what love looks like, and what God looks like. That, that will be the that will be the greatest draw of, of all. And I think it'd be good to think about, and if you want to go into this section a little bit to hear the question that you might answer in the journal on your own, what have you learned from another person's faith that's helped to strengthen yours? When has that been? When have you, when have you seen what love looks like? When have you seen God moving and working? When have you seen faith visible and it's made you, oh. Because I would guess that in not too many weeks from now, you're going to have a conversation with someone or you're going to write a letter to someone that shows them and reminds them of the best in them. Mm. And that's because someone did it for you. And you were like, oh, that's what love looks like. That's what faith and hope look like. That's it's visible what, now. It's visible. I know how to do it. I know how to live in it. Because I, I, I experienced it. And now... It doesn't, it doesn't feel so distant anymore. Yeah. And, and it's this, John, John's doing it. We touched him. We heard him. We saw him. We're inviting you into the fellowship and, and into the participation of his love and life. And then those people, I suspect, will then say the very same words to the next generation. We heard him. We saw him. We experienced him. We were touched by him. Um, we were in fellowship with him. And now we're inviting you into participation in the love and life of God. It's the way Christianity has remained active and alive for so many hundreds of years mm. is is God still alive and moving in it 
and and th- those apprentices of him are inviting others into that fellowship and participation also. Don't let him be hidden. Yeah. You can sh- you can show others him. Yeah, in you. Mm. Yeah. Okay, y'all. I'll see you next week for the book of Revelation. You're so excited. Oh, you guys, I forgot to say, I, I don't know if these are sold out by the time this video is going to come, but the Christmas, but our Christmas Advent, we're about to celebrate Christmas, a Luke 2 Christmas. So if you didn't see this last week, go look and you can see the, the preview of it. But oh, you want to go, so yeah, you want to go and get one for, um, for Christmas time because we're going to do Revelation and Christmas all together at the same time. So make the best sure month ever. we don't want you to lose out on any of the things that are coming. Okay. Love y'all. Oh, love. See?